Hi, this is Pat Duckworth, the author of Hot Women Rock, How to Discover Your Midlife Entrepreneurial Mojo. And sometimes when I'm doing these interviews, I know the person I'm interviewing really well. And sometimes they're quite a new connection. And that's how it is today. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about my guest. My guest today is an award-winning executive coach, speaker and author who works with busy professionals who want to have success, but without burning out. She's one of the top coaches in her field and her clients include directors, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and other senior leaders from leading institutions. Prior to founding Choose to Thrive, she was an executive director of Goldman Sachs where she was head of financial regulation. That was until she burnt out, a high price to pay. Since then, however, she's done extensive research and has worked with hundreds of women helping them create the building blocks to prosper, grow and flourish at both their work and in their personal life. She now puts her own physical and mental well-being at the top of the pile, as we all should do. So it's a big welcome to Sarah Sparks. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well, Pat. Very nice to see you. Thank you for having me on your show. Well, it looks like you're sparkling there, so... <laughs> Let's, yeah. Let's get into it. Tell me, what did you do when you first left school? Did you have a plan? Oh, I did have a plan and I had a dream. Um, but my dream was thwarted by um, a headmistress who told me I'd never, never make it. And I believed her. I wanted to be a doctor and that was my dream. And when she said, oh, you'll never make it, I didn't even bother to try and apply which is crazy looking back. But um, so I thought I did the next best thing and go and do biochemistry and physiology at university, which I did. Um, and I enjoyed it in many, many ways. But the opportunity I had at the end was to do a PhD. And I thought actually talking to rice and mats, rats for the next two or three years is not going to be my thing. I just needed people. You know, I'm a people person. And uh, so my dad set me a challenge. Again, uh, a person who I thought of as a person of influence and significance dictated my future. He said, you should be an accountant. I bet you couldn't get in. And for me, a challenge like that was, uh, you know, like a red rag to a bull. I was, I was off and I managed to get into Arthur Anderson, the best and most prestigious accountancy firm at the time, paying the big, biggest salary of all the accountancy firms, just to prove my dad that I could do it. Fantastic. Crazy. So there's the, the first lesson, don't take on other people's beliefs. That is a huge lesson oh. that everybody needs, isn't it? Absolutely, and boy, if I had the wisdom I do now, of course, when I was back with that younger self, I would not have taken my headmistress's opinion as read. I'd at least have given it a go at least have given it a go. Yeah. And I also would not have um, uh, jumped at my father's challenge about becoming an accountant. I ended up being a very good accountant. Um, I, I like numbers, I'm very logical in thinking. So it actually suited me in many ways, but it wasn't what I was put on the earth to do. I, again, I'm a people's person and you know, talking to numbers is a bit like talking to rice and mats. There's not a lot of feedback. So, so it was another you know, interesting lesson as I look back. So how did your career development go from there? Did you stay with the same company or what did you do? No, um, I left Arthur Anderson to join another accountancy firm, but then I found my way back into um, finance within banking. First of all, I joined Salomon Brothers, as it was then part of Citigroup now. And then I was headhunted to join Goldman's. And I loved those environments. They were work hard, play hard places. They played good money. You know, I really did enjoy working with people who are very bright, moving mountains. But I didn't know what was going on. I didn't realize just what a treadmill I was on and how the shiny things of a good salary and a car potentially and being able to have a nice holiday and save up for a good home were traps, mm. were really traps for me. And I fell for it headline, hook, line and sinker. So I had a very successful career and I did enjoy it. But... I didn't know where to stop. So what happened next? Well, uh, there was one very, very 
distinctive morning. It was, I think it was something like July the 25th in 1995, so a long time ago now. But I remember ha not getting any sleep that night. I, I had a job as head of financial regulation of everything outside of the US. So someone could call me day or night. And I had a, many a call that night with disrupted sleep about things that were going on over there. And I was in a complete panic. Um, I knew what they'd done over there was not a good thing. And I needed to get hold of my boss, somebody who I now call Slippery Jim. Um, anyway, I was, got up really early, jumped into a taxi, shot along the King's Road, which is a, a very straight road in London, that you can go straight through the city of London very easily, particularly at that time in the morning. It was so quiet. The birds were singing, the sky was blue, but I felt sick really sick in my stomach and the thought of any sort of food just made me rich but I went got into the office and I remember calling across to my boss Slippery Jim and saying have you got a minute can you help me and he waddled over to me he was an American guy with his thick American New York accent and said what's up Sarah why are you interrupting my coffee sorry back-to-back -back meetings can't help you today but call me at the end of the day and tell me it's done. That's his attitude. And he turned his back and walked away. Mm. And that was the, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I collapsed in the office. And the next thing I remember was being in the primary hospital. Wow. Mm. So I'm going to tell you that I used to have a colleague that I called Teflon Howard. Because <laughs> everything just slid off. Absolutely. And what was surprising, well, Unusual about Slippery Jim was he was significantly older than the average age. The average age when I was at Goldman Sachs, I did some research on this, when I was, uh, the average age was early 20s. Yeah. And he was in his late 40s, early 50s, which just showed you just how slippery he had become because you know, he was not a good leader. He was certainly not a good manager either. Yeah. And yet he was climbing that ladder very successfully and hanging on in there. So before that morning, had you had any warning symptoms or anything, or did this just come out the blue? It felt like it came out of the blue, but on, on reflection, of course, I had the, some warning signs. I hadn't been sleeping. I was finding it really difficult to sleep. So my way of coping with that was getting to sleep on wine. Yeah. Um, I you know, found it really difficult to think straight. My mind was all muddled. I couldn't take in information in the same way as I used to. But I just thought, you know, I you know, just get on with it and just, I just toss those things aside. You know, I kept getting completely and utterly overwhelmed with the smallest of things. I was short-tempered with the people I loved. Um, I was very tearful. Yeah. You know, very close to emotional you know, displays, whether that was anger or tears. Um, very, very short few. So, yes. I did have the warning signs, but I just didn't know they were warning signs. Well, and yeah, I mean, these are the classical signs of burnout, aren't they? But they, people don't realise, they just think, oh, well, I'm not sleeping so well, and that's why I'm feeling irritable. Mm -hmm. They don't know the chemistry that's going on inside the body that is, um, will find its way to reach a climax. Absolutely, and I think that's the, the thing that I really noticed in re on reflection is I had many, many times when my body was knocking at the door saying, yeah. watch out, I'm, you know, I'm like, help, I don't know what to do, and I ignored it. I, I, you know those Duracell batteries? I'm probably not allowed to say Duracell. On. Anyway, right. <laughs> they've got those little bunny things. Yeah, I can keep going. Well, that was me, and my mantra was, I can cope, I can cope, I can cope, yeah. I can cope. And actually... It was such a folly not to pause, reflect, just take stock, have a holiday. I, you know, I worked yeah. all weekends, most weekends, and even on holiday, I was working. So and, I was and the body finds the way. I've talked to a lot of women, you know, for Hot Women Rock, and, um, you know, these signs occur. And what I say is, you know, sometimes the universe gives you a little tap, you know, it just goes, come on now, you need to do something different. But if you ignore it, it becomes a bit more like a slap and you really want to do something before you get the full, full on punch. Absolutely. You know, the right. universe is trying to tell you something. Just listen to it. Absolutely. And what I find fa fascinating is that, is that if we um, were employing someone else and putting that person through what we're putting through, through we'd end up in prison for abuse. Yeah. 
and yeah. yet we're perfectly prepared to do it. So tell us what happened after what happened from the Priory onwards. Well, um, I, I have to say I'm not proud of this. <laughs> the reality is, I, I was in the Priory Hospital for quite a long time. I spent some time at home recovering and thought I'm perfectly well enough to go home, go back to work, not go home, go back to work. And so I did. And I went through the whole thing again. Yeah. I had not listened. And so when I went back to the, to the Priory Hospital for the second time, my consultant was saying, you know, Sarah, this has got to stop. You are not paying heed. Um, and if you don't, something even more drastic is going to be happening. So you need to take stock. And that was the wake up call really for me that actually he was right. I needed to make wiser choices. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I needed to make wiser choices about my life, how I was living, how I was working, the fact that I wasn't actually on the priority pile, let alone anywhere near the top of the priority pile. Um, but it was a very long way back, very long way back from there. Um, I had years and years and years of infertility. My body was just so stressed, mm. it wouldn't conceive. And that was heartbreaking. Yeah. I'm sure you must have had other of your hot woman rock go come and talk to you about that. Yeah. Um, it took me a very long time. I did try and go back um, in conversation with Goldman Sachs, but I realized I, had, I hadn't got the staffing anymore. Yeah. I was not going to be able to hold down that type of prestigious job anymore. So it had a huge impact on my salary and my ability to earn. Um, my husband got fed up and decided to leave. Oh. So you know, all in all, massive prices to pay. Yeah. And I reckon... 15 it took probably about 15 years to fully recover mm. they told me it would take five years and I, I i honestly believed i'd get much better quicker than that and after five years if i got tired i wouldn't be depressed which was a major success yeah um thing for me but it, it took an awful lot longer to get really back on track and even to this day i have to be very aware of what's going on yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what was your way back? You didn't go back to Goldman Sachs. What did you decide to do next? I ended up um, working for a very small corporate finance boutique. Numbers again. <laughs> I guess because that's what I was good at and that's what I could do easily and earn some money. I went back and did some corporate finance work. But what I found really fascinating was I was more interested in what the entrepreneur wanted to do with their life, mm. not how they were going to build their business so all these many of the entrepreneurs i was working with this is in the it sector in particular they wanted to build their businesses and then sell them and i was going but but then what you know, you'll be a youngster what are you going to do then and that was a thing that they'd not really considered how do they want to live their life not just run their business yeah. so that was really another wake-up call for me that actually that was my sweet spot helping yeah. people get clear about what they really wanted and how they could create it, create wealth along the way, but actually get to that ultimate outcome. Yeah. And so I transitioned from being a corporate financier into being an executive coach. Um, and I've been doing that since 1999 now. Fantastic. So this is Pat Duckworth. And my guest today is Sarah Sparks, who's an executive coach. And Sarah, do you feel now, you know, you were drawn to medicine at the beginning does this kind of work you're doing now feel more like that, you know, like that purpose that you had all the way back in your teenage years? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it also echoes some of the things that I did in my, my university career, of course, doing biochemistry and physiology. You know, what we're discovering now in neuroscience mm. and you know, what happened to me, I can now make sense of it in a completely different way because I had experienced it firsthand and now I've got a theory that supports what actually happened to me. So uh, yeah, I, and I, I so know I'm doing what I should be doing on this earth. Um, and it is a, just a wonderful feeling when you know that you're on track and this is the difference I'm meant to be making. But boy, did it take a long route, didn't it? And, you know, yeah. and part of me is delighted about that because I wouldn't be the coach I am mm. or the um, make the difference I can make without having gone through it firsthand. Um, but yes, it was a painful experience to do at the same time. So is this part of what you teach your clients, this whole finding their purpose? Absolutely. So, so for me, when you have connected with your 
purpose and your sense of contribution. It's like rocket fuel for the soul. That's mm-hmm. what I call it. You know? um, and it, it, it doesn't have to be, in my experience, it doesn't have to be your whole job. Yeah. You can create meaning and purpose in some aspect of your life and still get that rocket fuel. So you don't have to leave an organization if you happen to be in one or change the direction of your business. You can get your sense of contribution and purpose in small incremental ways or even outside in your community. So mm. it doesn't have to be work, work. And okay. I think that for me makes such a big difference. And it's delightful when people kind of get that, they, they, they realize they do have some elements of purpose and contribution in their lives and they hadn't really counted it because it wasn't work. Yeah, definitely. Difference. So what does success mean to you now? Isn't that a great question? Success for me now is all about me thriving. Yeah. And I know that when I'm truly thriving, I'm also financially abundant too. Yeah. Um, and so success for me is fulfilling. It's um, just, I, I'm at my best. I'm able to support and guide my clients to be their best. And it's just, again, it just feels in harmony with the universe. That sounds a bit woo-woo perhaps to some. But for me, it's just, I'm a bit like a tuning fork then. And we're all vibrating just the right, right, the right, I um, can't remember the word. What's it? Frequency. Thank you very much. <laughs> we sometimes have to help each other with these words. Yeah. And what would be your top tips then for a new entrepreneur? Well, I, whether it's a new one or a, um, a stalwart entrepreneur, what I notice particularly um, about entrepreneurs, because of the environment they're working in, because they're probably often working on their own and have limited resources in terms of time and people to support them often, that actually pacing yourself is so key. Mm. And this idea of thinking of it as a marathon and not a race, yeah. not, a, not a short-term sprint, It is a marathon. If you really want to have long-term success, you need to set yourself up in that way. And that, for me, means stress and then rest, stress and then rest. Exert yourself, but then have time to recover. And I do, now I do, with all of my clients who come through my coaching programs, and even some of the ones who come through my Choose to Thrive online programs, I do first beat lifestyle assessments. I don't really come across those. Yeah. That helps people really understand what's going on in their physiology so that they can sense when they're in the stress response versus in the recovery response and getting that balance right is fundamental for long-term success and the thing i want to point out to the audience is i don't know whether they're aware of this but you're four times more likely to burn out Mm -hmm. for mental ill health if you're an entrepreneur versus the general population so it is really 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 important issue for entrepreneurs to clock Yeah, definitely. Watching out for those signs. So, Sarah, it's been great talking to you. Anybody watching, if they want to find out more about you, how can they do that? Well, they can do that in a number of ways. Um, My website is sarahsparks.co.uk. And on there, there is a free handout about how to stay on top of things. Excuse me. (coughs) They can also join me on social media. Choose to Thrive is my tagline. I've got to choose to thrive. Twitter page and also my Facebook page and if they really want to get involved in getting sort of regular tips about thriving there's two good ways of doing that either joining my thrive tribe on Facebook or sending an email to sarah at sarahsparks.co.uk with thriving tips in the in the banner and I'll make sure they get included in future um, email distributions I do which I don't overwhelm people but I'm regularly giving them tips about how to thrive Fantastic. Definitely sign up for that. So what have we learned today? We've learned that there are signs if you're burning out and you need to notice them and take action. You know, the body needs rest. This is all about the the hormones, the cortisol and adrenaline coming into the system. And it's not meant to stay there for long periods of time. So if you notice the signs, you know, the feeling very tired, being unable to sleep, feeling emotional, getting more viral infections. There's a lot of signs. Be aware of them and take action. And then when you're living your purpose, that's when you get that rocket fuel, when you just feel unstoppable because you're doing what you were put here to do. Mm. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been great talking to you.
Yeah, I'd love being here. Thank you very much indeed, Pat. And to all our viewers, uh, thank you for watching and watch out for more of these wonderful interviews with amazing entrepreneurs. And I'll see you next time.